Good afternoon and welcome to the Nantucket Civic League's Meet the Candidates program. I'm Alan Reinhardt, president of the Nantucket Civic League. Now, the Civic League, as you probably know, is the umbrella organization for 22 different area associations, and we represent approximately 2,200 members throughout the island. We have um, area associations all the way from Walwinet out to Smith's Point and everywhere in between. Now, part of the Civic League's mission is to promote informed citizen participation in local government, and we do this through our programs, through Meet the Articles uh, two weeks ago, Meet the Candidates, and the various forums that we present through the course of the year. The purpose of this afternoon's program is to give the candidates running for office an opportunity to introduce themselves and uh, state their qualifications for office and to make a case for why they should be elected. The program will be broadcast on NCTV 18 and on Gino uh, TV channel 99. And without further ado, Peter Morrison from the Executive Board of the Civic League will be our moderator this afternoon. Peter? Thank you, Alan, and welcome all of you uh, today. I'm, your, I'm going to be your moderator, and today's program, as Alan said, is designed to inform you who have attended and also uh, many more voters who can view subsequent rebroadcasts on Channel 18 and Channel 99. Uh, you're going to hear from four candidates who are running for two seats for Board of Selectmen, and then from three candidates who are running for a single seat on the land bank. And finally, we've invited the HDC's new non-incumbent members to introduce themselves to you, and we have one such individual who has agreed to appear at the end for two minutes or so. A um, little bit about how the time is going to go. We've allocated two minutes for each candidate to present their qualifications for office and their positions on issues. Uh, then we will have uh, <coughs> questions from our two panelists to which each candidate will be invited to respond. And following that, I'll ask candidates to respond to written questions from you in the audience uh, to which the candidates will respond. And I'd ask that you submit your questions in writing on a card. And to do so, you just raise your hand at any time, uh, and our volunteers who are situated around the room will uh, provide you with a pen and a card and then they will deliver the questions uh, to the moderator. And at the end, we'll ask each candidate to make a very brief closing statement. Uh, we are going to have Pat Newton act as our timekeeper today. Pat is at the end of the table uh, following a long tradition. Pat will ring our venerated bell to signal each candidate when their allotted time is up. Uh, just by way of background, a little history. This bell belonged to Jane Lamb, uh, who was our timekeeper for many years and was fondly known as the unofficial mayor of Wawinet. Jane used this very bell in her kindergarten class in the 1950s, and we keep it in service to honor the Civic League's tradition of service. It's a distinctive ring, uh, and it is both uh, polite and, I think, persuasive. So first let me introduce our two panelists who will be questioning the candidates. Seated on your far left is Dan Drake, host of Front Up on Geno TV's Channel 99. And next to him we have Elise Linscott with the Inquirer and Mirror. So we're going to begin with our four candidates for Board of Selectmen who are seated on the stage. And I'll ask each of you to limit your opening statements to two minutes and we'll start uh, in alphabetical order with Rick Atherton. Rick? Thanks, Peter. Turn the button on, just, just like Wednesday night. Thanks, Peter. And to the Civic League, and welcome those who are here and who are going to watch it either subsequently on uh, either Gino or Channel 18. Uh, my name is Rick Atherton. You know, sometimes you think you know everybody on the island, but I know I don't. So I do want to introduce myself. Um, I, our family has been coming to Nantucket since we first vacationed here in 1972. 
We've been year-round residents for the longest period in our life that we've lived anywhere. That's from 1991 on. I've had the good fortune to have the time available since we moved to Nantucket to be involved in civic affairs, a number of nonprofit organizations and the Civic League itself. Uh, just purely by chance, I applied to join the town's finance committee early on, was appointed by the board who didn't have a clue, quite frankly, who I was. And I have enjoyed participating in that regard for many years, and I've had two terms as a member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I think I've shown that I'm knowledgeable about the issues. I try very hard to be fair and deliberative and be sure that our decision-making is information-based. Um, I think those attributes can carry forward. I think there are a lot of issues the town continues to face. It's faced a number of them for many years. And I think my, again, experience will stand me well in seeking your uh, vote for re-election as a member of the Board of Selectmen. One other sort of comment, there's a real sort of history involved with Nantucket, and, and I feel a, a certain pride, no matter what happens in the election, that I've been able to serve. There's a long history as an island. We all love the island. No matter how we feel on some issues, I think we all recognize there are going to be differences, but it's a place we love and want to respect. Thank you. Okay, next we'll hear from Bob DeCosta. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is... Turn the mic on. My name is Bob DeCosta. I am uh, seeking a second term for the Board of Selectmen. I was elected three years ago. I am a year-round Nantucket, not a native. I was not born here, but I've been here since I was six weeks old, and that's considered important to specify, so I am open about that. But um, I've been here my whole life. Nantucket is my home. It will continue to be my home. My family uh, started a the Albacore charter fishing business in 1968. We're the oldest charter fishing business on Nantucket. I took it over 20 years ago when my father passed away. I am a business owner in Nantucket. I fish in the summer. I do construction in the winter. I um, decided to run for the Board of Selectmen three years ago because I felt that I couldn't, I had tried to help fix things from the outside and felt like I couldn't get things done and it was time to uh, stand up and put the time in and I had no idea what the time meant until I got into this office and it, it's an immense amount of uh, a time um, but it's time that I enjoy you know on average I probably work 20 to 30 hours a week on this um, a lot of it a lot there's a lot of research and time that go into this to really understand both sides of a subject um, and uh, I that's one of the things I pride myself on is I try to really get a full picture of it pro and con, and then I make a decision, and I stand by that decision. And um, if there's one thing that I try to bring to the board, it's common sense, and, and, and to um, get rid of a lot of the, uh, the fluff that sometimes occurs with events and different things. So um, I've enjoyed my time. I'd like to do one more term, because I have some projects that I haven't finished, and I'd like to see them through. And uh, if I'm fortunate enough to get elected again, I can tell you right now that this will be my last term, two and done. So, thank you. Adam, you're up next. Okay. Uh, thank you to the Civic League for hosting this forum and your continued dedication to citizen engagement. Uh, about two years ago, I left a very lucrative and stable career uh, to pursue a life of service, something I continue to do here on Nantucket. I am well educated. I have plenty of experience with business, uh, politics, and government. But what I think really qualifies me to be a selectman is my commitment and passion to this community. The reason I'm running now is because since I was a kid, I've seen the continual diminishment of our local community. More people being pushed off island uh, due to increased prices and unreliable housing, the loss of artists, craftsmen, and the local small businesses to make way for streamlined uh, formula businesses that offer nothing for their uh, long-term stability or community development. Um, oh, also the lack of engagement and the loss of a cohesive community voice. Uh, this is a path I think we've been drawn down by our leaders, often with good intentions, but I think it's time to change course. A leader isn't just someone who listens to the facts and makes decisions. A leader is someone who will get out there and fight for this community. 
who won't just agree to progress, but who will implement progress. Uh, as a selectman, I will not always have the answers, but it will be my job to find them for you. I won't always agree with you, but I will always be there and I'll always listen. And I can promise you that any good idea for this community will not be dismissed. And it'll be my purpose to find a common thread between our different opinions, beliefs, and concerns, and then find a way for them to work for this community. Uh, I'm not here for the beautiful beaches, or the amazing food, or the wonderful shops. I'm here because this is where my people are, this is where my community is, and I love Nantucket. Uh, and without the local community, I believe that Nantucket has no soul. So for more detailed information, vote adamreed.com. <laughs> Excellent timing. Thank you. Finally, we'll hear from Clifford Williams. Hi, I'm Clifford Williams. Um, I was born and raised in Nantucket. Uh, my family's been here for, I don't know, 350 years, I guess, since the beginning. Um, once I graduated from uh, high school in 1981, I left for about 20 years. I worked for um, some of the biggest defense contractors, uh, petroleum helicopters, United Airlines, uh, General Dynamics, um, I work in California, Boston, so I've got, I think I've got a lot of experience as far as uh, unions, non-unions, corporations, uh, living outside of Nantucket, and then the experience of being here in Nantucket. Um, I've worked for the FAA at the airport for the last 13 years. I ran for Selectman, I don't know how many, four years ago for the first time uh, when I came, became discouraged with the uh, how the way things were being run at the airport. Um, we mulled through that and hopefully things are uh, in the right direction. Uh, also since then, uh, I've been able to be on the finance committee for the last four years, and I believe uh, those experiences uh, with the town budget and different uh, other organizations and um, committees I've, I've been on to qualify me for uh, the Board of Selectmen. Uh, and hopefully I'll get your vote. Very good. Uh, we're right on schedule and we're going to now have some questions from our two panelists and I think maybe the best way to do this is just rotate from, we'll start with you Dan and then Elise and then back to Dan and Elise. And in each case um, we're going to have a question and then we'd like each candidate to offer a response no more than one minute and there will be an opportunity for follow-up questions optionally uh, by the questioners. Okay, so Dan you're first. Thank you Peter. Um, very simply, what is the most pressing issue facing the town now in your view and how would you propose to address it? Want to start alphabetically, Rick? Sure. Well, I think there, I'm not sure there's ever only one issue, Dan, but I, I think overall if you wanted to try and encapsulate an issue, I think keeping Nantucket Nantucket, and what I mean by that is our water quality, uh, dealing with our open spaces, our beaches, our historic architecture. I think those are the overriding elements that make Nantucket attractive. They're key economic drivers to bring tourists and second homeowners and en enable the rest of us who live here year round to continue to enjoy the island we love. So the Board of Selectmen, I think, has to, con has to sort of have an enhanced role in thinking about those important items. Thank you. Um, Bob, do you want to go next? Yeah. <clears throat> For me, it's water quality. Um, it's all about clean harbors, ponds, creeks. Um, I've, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to run again was to see the comprehensive wastewater management plan mm -hmm. through to its end and the, the, uh, the, uh, sewering of the areas that need to be sewered, storm drain improvements, uh, things of that nature. It's, a, it's one of those things that um, even if you fix it tomorrow, it takes quite a bit of time before you start to see an, see an improvement. And the, the same can be said about the deterioration. You may not see the deteri deterioration now of what's happening, but if you don't fix it, you will in a few years. And then by the time you see it, it's too late. So, you know, we have one of the last scallop industries in the country. Um, it's one of the f uh, only winter industries that isn't involve uh, building. And at some point, the building's going to disappear here. So I think we need to continue with our water quality issues. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is hard to pick just one issue. Uh, for me, big picture, it's the loss of the local community, and I think the most pressing issue for us right now is the lack of housing and what the town's going to do about creating affordable housing. Um, I know across the street, uh, we have a lot of buildable lots that we've had for almost 10 years that were purchased with the intent of building uh, affordable housing, and yet we've done nothing about it. We've built this beautiful $18 million police station, but we still have no affordable housing. And I think the way the town can do it is by creating town-owned uh, affordable rentals that would be managed through a local partnership with uh, developers and builders here on the island. Um, yeah, housing, that's the big one. Water quality is important too, though. Clifford. I'd echo the same thing, so water quality, but I think we've got a good handle on that. I think we've, um, as you talk to other towns, uh, by suing the town 100 years ago, we obviously uh, won up to everybody. Um, right now we're facing, uh, as Adam says, the, uh, the population, uh, affordable housing on Nantucket. Whether you work at Cumberland Farms or you work for the town of Nantucket, uh, I think in the next 10, 15, 20 years, as individuals uh, probably retire from Nantucket, that might already have housing, how do we attract new employees or new residents to the town of Nantucket, how they can afford to live here? Um, it's a big problem, and like I said, the school system, uh, the, the population's exploded up there. Um, it's just a broad range of issues. I don't think there's one. Uh, before I turn to Elise, Dan, do you have any follow-up questions on this one? I'll hold oh, it till okay. my next All right. Elise, uh, you're up. All right. What role, if any, should the Board of Selectmen play in proposing or entering partnerships with private organizations for projects that impact both public and private land? Rick, say that again. You can start at the same spot or yeah. rotate? Um, I can start, I can <laughs> start I with Bobby, yeah. yeah. Good idea, start with Bobby. Actually, usually we rotate right. the first guy <laughs> okay. question by question. So I'm still in the learning mode, so That's Bob, all right, I'm we'll first. help you out. Okay. Yeah, can you repeat um, the question again first? Okay. What was the question? Sure. What role, if any, should the Board of Selectmen play in proposing or entering partnerships with private organizations for projects that impact both public and private land? Well, um, I think it's a very important role for the town, and it's one of those things where you've got to think outside the box to fix the box. And, uh, you know, in, this, in, in housing, for example, where Adam talked about, um, if you build affordable housing and you use state or HUD money, the majority of the people who live here that need the housing don't qualify for it. So it really doesn't work that way. So if you, but you've had some type of private partnership where a private developer built it with conjunction with the town where it could really go to who needs the housing, which is the, the people that live here year round. And I'm not talking about the lower class, I'm talking about the middle class. What we consider middle class here is not, do not qualify for housing, for affordable housing under state and federal guidelines. So, and that's what we're losing here. We're not losing our lower class, if, if we even really have a lower class here, but we're losing our middle class workforce. Um, the other is in erosion control. Um, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of places besides the Bluff at Sankety where we're gonna have erosion control problems in the next 10 years and private partnerships are the only way to fix it. Um, for me, I think it depends on what type of public-private partnership we're talking about. Uh, when we were talking about combining uh, Visitor services with the Chamber of Commerce, I didn't support that uh, sort of private partnership. But when we're talking about the housing, uh, and I agree with Bob on this one, uh, the way to do it would be to partner with uh, local businesses. I think it's important to stay local though. So just any sort of private partnership doesn't work. Uh, private partnerships with local businesses, small local businesses is a good thing. And if we're talking about building housing, then yes, uh, partnering with uh, local developers who can manage and build these houses and then profit along with the town and the people of Nantucket, that would be the best way to go. So yes, sometimes, no, sometimes. Obviously, if uh, we're involved, we have to be involved if we have uh, assets involved and the liability that goes with it. Um, Sherman Commons is probably a, a great example of how we leased the land and it just things deteriorated from there. and. Maybe we should have more input into that whole operation from the beginning and uh, what the uh, pitfalls are, what the positives and minuses are so that uh, those things don't happen again. And finally, Rick. Yeah, I, th I think uh, we do have two examples right off the bat where we've had 
public-private partnerships where the use of town-owned property has been involved. One is Sherburn Commons. The other is the Hunting Association. In, in both cases, there was a really a, a fairly active dialogue with town meeting about how those arrangements would work. Both arrangements went to town meeting. The property was owned by the citizens of Nantucket. And in both cases, town meeting had an opportunity to vote on the leases uh, which were arranged for the use of the property by private entities. Um, so I think those are good examples of how public-private partnerships can develop a broad base of support and receive approval or not by the owners of the property. Elise, do you have any follow-up? questions at this point? No, I do not. Okay, Dan, next question from you. I was going to ask a question about rental housing. A couple of you have already addressed that, but uh, I think it's it's rel relevant to another question, which is um, that very often the government, mostly the government here, seems to be reactive rather than proactive. And it's when somebody's, when the waves are lapping at the foot of the bluff or when the state is threatening us with penalties or something that... Uh, we um, um, finally respond. So my question really is lack of leadership an issue in the governance of Nantucket. And if you agree that it is, there is, is there any solution to it or is it a structural problem of the way the government is set up? We'll start with you, Adam, on the response. Uh, well, there's also, I mean, there's always institutional problems with systems in our government. Um, but I do think our leaders could do a better job of being proactive. Uh, in getting out there and engaging people. Um, I lost my train of thought. I, yeah, is I it, forgot. Is it a structure, is it possible oh. that, for there to be greater leadership or is it a structural issue? Yes, it is possible for there to be better leadership by engaging citizens and uh, I think selecting, I like what Tobias does where he offers the office hours. I think being accessible to citizens um, and being proactive, uh, not just, like I said in my beginning speech, to not just make decisions and listen to facts, but to get out there and fight for things, to get out there and push things and support things and inform the people. Cliff? Uh, I do believe, I think that theory of structural is um, probably more prevalent than, than uh, leadership as a result of us being at the bottom rung of, of government, you know, the federal government, we've probably discussed it before, the federal government does what they want, the state government tries to do what they want, and then we're told what to do. So, uh, you know, as a selectman, you, you know, we don't just go out there and run the town the way we want to, we're, we're held by the Department of Revenue and their restrictions. So, um, I think we do the best we can, and uh, probably with less restrictions, it's a positive and negative to that, so. Great. You know, I, interesting, I think leadership comes, uh, when you're on a board, it takes five people, it takes three to govern on any particular issue. So leadership has to do with advocating for the positions you think are important. Uh, the one I think of over time that was really started with citizens, and often ideas do start with citizens, was the whole question of fertilizer and you go back to the town meeting and the board with some leadership I think made sure we had a committee that represented all the interested parties and stakeholders and that process the article 68 committee enabled the community as a whole to come to a recommendation and a solution to move forward with fertilizer regulation which could be accomplished locally it did not take a state to step in and we found a way to do it. So I, that's an example where the board can facilitate and help bring issues forward and come to, I think, proper leadership conclusions. Bob? Um, um, well, I, I'm gonna take a little bit of different tact here. I, I don't think sitting in an office for a couple hours a week and putting a quote on the board fixes problems. Um, I'm, my phone number is out there in the public and my email's out there and anyone in the public can contact me any time of the day or night and I always get back to them or I answer the phone at that point. The reality with this job is, is that this takes an immense amount of time above the Wednesday night meetings. Probably on average 20 to 25 hours a week of subcommittee meetings, 
uh, phone calls, research, and there's always priorities that come to the to the top that we have to deal with right away. There seems like we spend three quarters of our time being firemen and putting out fires. That's just the reality of being a selectman. Um, it's really easy to sit here and go, well, we need to have a long-term plan, but and we do, and we work on that constantly. But at the same time, we have to deal with issues that arise on a constant basis. So I think that the Board of Selectmen as a whole do a great job, and I think that what Rick said about three members voting to have the majority is, 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 is just the way our government's set up. Dan, do you have any follow-up questions? I do actually have a follow-up. Um, my follow-up question is, could the town manager play a greater role in providing leadership on some of these issues? The town, not the individual, the, the, the job. <clears throat> and I think you're up, Cliff. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, the town of Nantucket, is, it's pretty diverse, and it gives the town administration a great deal of uh, responsibility. I've lived in small towns in New Hampshire where the biggest thing is the school and the fire department. There's no water department. There's no marine department. There's no airport. So... Um, I think, I guess as far as leadership, I guess they could, they're doing the best they can do right now. I, I, I think it's, uh, as a selectman and as Bobby said, you know, the whole, the whole uh, community needs to get involved. I, you can only surround yourself by good people and, and I think in Nantucket we're lucky to have a, a great deal of uh, educated and uh, people that have worked in different industries and come to, to retire here. So I think it's probably the whole community is, uh, it's uh, just like town meeting to that could help um, town administration. I don't know. I just think they're doing the best they can do right now. Right. It, it, it's interesting. The charter really gives the town manager significant responsibility and direct control over most of the management issues of our staff providing services. So I think there's already a structure that allows the town manager to be as active as the town manager feels is appropriate. You know, uh, sitting on a board and the way our structure works, I tend to be a little bit, um, I, I accept that we have a form of democracy which comes from town meeting to the board of selectmen through the voters, and we hire the town manager and the town manager is the administrator. The town manager does have a difficult task in trying to decide when to act independently of the board and when to bring issues to the board. And you have to watch how the individual holding that job accepts that responsibility. There's a corollary to the board making sure we communicate with the town manager what the priorities ought to be. So. Uh, I'm going to follow up where Rick left off in the fact that the town manager does uh, have to report to the Board of Selectmen and therefore the, the voters. And the board changes every year. And the, the uh, realities of what the board's important missions are change every year. And the town, I think the town manager and the town administration do a great job of dealing with that change along with the daily uh, obligations that they have with running all these different departments and uh, negotiating with contracts and dealing with town employees and the general public at large and everything that we have. I mean, you know, we're, as Clifford said, we're not a small little sleepy town in Vermont that has 4,000 people in it living year round. We, we're a town that's now somewhere between 10 and 12,000 estimated on a year round basis that jumps to almost 50, 60,000 in the summer. And we have a, uh, uh, the island home, and we have the airport, and we have the water company. We have three enterprise accounts, as well as the landfill that a lot of towns don't have. So we are, we're a pretty big corporation. And Adam? I think that everyone in the town, uh, town manager, town employees, uh, the selectmen, we, there's always more we can do. Uh, there's always ways we can do it better. I wouldn't wish any more work for Libby. It's a tough job. Uh, it's a long job, I'm sure. Uh, but I think it will be our role and uh, our job as selectmen to help guide her and or whoever is town manager uh, down that path uh, and to do things better and to do things uh, that are more effective for the community. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, we've got time about uh, five more minutes for one more quest round of questions. And I'm going to ask Elise to ask a question and each of you to respond. Then we'll go on to the uh, audience questions. 
Should the town consider a shift to merit-based pay structure for municipal employees? And if so, how could such a change be implemented? And if not, why not? And we'll start with you, Rick. Yeah, I, this is a subject that's come up often over the years. One of the uh, most difficult parts of a selectman's job and through us to the town manager is negotiating contracts with our staff. I mean, let's, let's be open about that. It's, it's partly pay and the benefit structure, but also it's the sort of uh, environment in which they operate. And I think merit pay, for example, is one that is difficult to implement. I think most citizens would feel that it's uh, appropriate to implement. Even such basic questions as appraisals of performance reviews on an annual basis for staff members are difficult in this environment. I just want to be open about that. Uh, the board is actively trying to encourage a better sort of salary administrative structure in order to uh, reward performance, but it's very difficult to get specific outcomes without the negotiation process. Bob? I believe merit pay is the only way that we should be rewarding our employees. I don't believe anyone in this world should get rewarded for just being at a job. That's the way I was raised. That's the way I've always worked. That's the way it's always worked for me. Um, do I think that that's a reality in, in town government with the union contracts that we have? Probably not. But I think that that's what we should have. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but um, I served three years in the military before I came back to Nantucket, and one of the things that was most frustrating to me was I would do my job 10 times better than the guy next to me, but he got the promotion because he had been there three months longer than me. And to me, that's just a mistake, and unfortunately, that's the, that's the rules that we're playing with with the union contracts that we have, and I think it would be very difficult to negotiate that out, but uh, that's, that's where I believe we should be. Adam? Uh, I know we're waiting for a wage and compensation report, so I'd have to defer to that to make a final answer. But I support anything that's good for the town employees. <laughs> and whatever is best for the town employees is what I'll support. I do support merit system uh, ideologically, but I would really have to look at all the numbers to say yes or no on that one. Um, but it, the town employees are the ones who make this town run, and without them, this town would not run. And so uh, whatever is beneficial to them is where I would go with that one. Thank you. Uh, he's right, we're talking about the Wage and Compensation com Committee, and I, and I think that's gonna be a great achievement so we can finally um, have a pay scale where if you're a secretary, you start out at this much, and then you top out at this much. And if you're a truck driver with a CDL license, or you can operate a crane, or whatever it may be, you get paid in a certain range, and, and that's it. We just don't, because you were an employee for the town for 40 years, you continue to get paid more and more. Or if uh, your boss thinks you should get m more pay, um, you end up making 150 grand, and you're not even an administrative staff member. Um, as far as the merit based, uh, I worked for General Dynamics and if you could save them money and you could prove you saved them money, then you got half the money which they saved, say the first time, whether it was um, we launched satellites. So if you, I think they didn't paint the uh, tank on the space shuttle. They, it, was, it was gray or orange, then somebody got half that money. So I think that's the best way to do it. Very good. Uh, we're right on schedule now to begin with the questions from the audience, and I've got quite a few of them here. None of them overlap. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go with uh, the questions as I've received them in order. And the next person uh, to be first will be Bob DaCosta. And uh, an audience member has asked, uh, would you consider, I'm sorry, this is for the land bank candidates. Um, <laughs> we'll take those. Sorry. I'll give it a look. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, last summer, we hit 45 megawatts of power demand in July. How would you address this growing need, and would you consider developing alternative energy, such as wind, uh, wave, wind, and tidal energy, to avoid a $60 million third cable, which the uh, taxpayers will have to pay for. And we'll start with Bob. Uh, I think energy conservation is the first thing that we can do. We can do that right now. Uh, Lauren's done a phenomenal job with 
uh, home audits, and um, everyone who's had them reeks the benefits from it. Um, but there's still a lot of homes on the island that haven't had them, especially our summer homes. Um, as far as uh, renewable energies, whether it be wind, tidal, whatever, uh, I'm fine with exploring them, but I am not in favor of voting through one just for the sake of going green. I think they have to make financial sense to the town. And um, anyone who knows me knows that I was not in favor of the turbine at the landfill. Um, and the reason for that was I crunched the numbers and the numbers didn't make sense to me. And I don't believe that we should build wind turbines or wave energy or whatever if it's going to cost us more money than it's costing us right now. Um, I am a strong believer, I think, in tidal, in tidal uh, energy. I think that that's something that we can look at in the future. The technology is not there yet, but I think it will be. Okay. Adam, you're next. I am 150% in favor of any sort of renewable energy. Um, I believe that it is the future. I believe that we have the technology. I've looked at the numbers as well, and they, are, they aren't perfect. But if we're talking about a long-term vision for Nantucket, a long-term plan, then it is affordable. It's not just affordable, it's responsible. It could potentially provide free energy for the town of Nantucket, um, in addition to creating revenue for the town of Nantucket. Uh, and it's green, and I support things that are green. Uh, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of renewable energy. Cliff? I was obviously on the finance committee when all the windmill uh, debate came up, and you were a big part of it. Um, I think your question was, uh, should we have renewable energy to prevent a third cable? Um, the problem with that is when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, uh, and it's a calm day in the ocean, you still need electricity. And if you don't have the grid in place, you're going to have a rolling brownout or whatever it may be. So those things don't, even though they can, uh, I guess, save us from uh, using uh, more energy on certain days or uh, certain situations, um, it's not going to prevent us from putting the infrastructure in that we need for the needs of the town as we grow. Rick? Yeah, it's interesting. The... Um question of alternative energy. We do have uh, Lauren Sinatra and George Aronson, and George is a, a real pro, and he's been exploring all these options, and when one works, I'm sure it'll come forward and the Board of Selectmen and the community will support that. In the meantime, in terms of a third cable, I, I think it should be clear that conservation and lower energy use is the real solution to that. There's a lot more bang for the buck and everybody knocking off 15% of your energy usage. We can do that now. We don't have to do the other things. If they can come along and work, that's fine. But conservation is the way to avoid a third cable. Okay, the next question I have from the audience is, uh, what is your position on the potential purchase by the town of the Egan property on Mill Hill? And we'll begin with Adam. Uh, I support any sort of land purchase by the town. Um, I think it's important, uh, since land is a commodity here, obviously, and we do have this housing problem, that any sort of land that we can keep in our possession for the future is going to be beneficial to us down the road. Um, I have some friends that are involved in it, and it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, then there's also the fact that it's a park. Um, there's people that border on it, and it's been in, in the town for a long time. and so. Uh, as we move forward, giving up this land, giving up this property is going to come back to bite us in 20 years, and we're going to say, ah, we should have bought that property. So that's my opinion on that one. Cliff? I wasn't that involved, and in I know we've been eyeing the property since uh, last year or two years ago. Uh, I think it might be already sold to someone else, but and, um, if that's what we want to do, low-income housing, or affordable housing, I should say, um, uh, that's not my expertise, but I guess the town town meeting is probably the best place to decide whether or not we want the property. Rick? Yeah, I, I've been public in terms of um, my feelings about the use of tax dollars to purchase the uh, Egan property. I think there are uh, other higher priority properties the town can deal with. We have substantial capital requirements coming our way. Um, so it's not a piece that I will vote for in terms of using tax dollars. I recognize that town meeting sometimes feels differently than 
any of us do as individuals, and town meeting will speak on that issue, as it has in the past. But I'm being very frank in my approach that it's not the highest priority. Well, I voted to put it to town meeting, but I will vote against it. I think it's a, um, not a good capital expense for the town, considering the large capital expense we have coming up. I believe that the island's done such a great job uh, saving our open space that we've priced our young people right out of Nantucket. The land bank is great, but the land bank has been the single driving force to drive real estate prices on this island through the roof. Every time a subdivision piece of land came up that would have been probably divide, subdivided into, a for, into housing units for year-round population, it was purchased by the land bank and the, drove the real estate prices higher and higher and higher. And we've done such a great job preserving Nantucket that in 50 years there'll be nobody here but the people that can afford the million dollar homes and the, and, the, and the workforce that lives in the transient housing. And the American dream is to own your own home and own your own piece of land. And affordable housing is not the solution to that. And so every time one of these chunks comes up that we want to buy just to keep open space, I've, I'm not necessarily in favor of them. Okay, we're going to start with you first, Cliff, on this one. Understanding that you are only one vote, how would you hope to address the well-publicized needs and concerns of the Sherburne Commons residents, the Our Island home patients, and the elderly who use the undersized Salt Marsh Senior Center? I haven't been involved enough with the Sherburne Commons other than um it seems to be coming up again, and I know uh, there's been different ideas to move island home people out there at one time, but I don't think it meets the code as a, as the for that. Um, our island home needs a, a lot of work uh, uh, as far as capital improvements. Uh, I don't think it's a community. Um, I know when the uh, AC is it ACDC whatever the acronym is. Every time uh, uh, an issue comes up for the elderly in Nantucket, I think town meeting usually votes positively for it. So as I'm not an expert in that um, field, uh, I think uh, the town has uh, continuously uh, always met the needs of the elderly when uh, challenged. Rick? Yep. Sherburn Commons. Um, we, we find ourselves in a situation where the owner wants to sell. And uh, I think the Board of Selectmen uh, reacted to that, I think, in a very proper way, tried to talk to the potential buyer and weigh our responsibilities to the taxpayers as the owner of the land and our responsibilities to the residents of Sherburne Commons who went through a very difficult experience before. And I think we've come to a point now where there are a number of possible solutions. One is to uh, possibly set up a new nonprofit so that the Sherburn Commons can exist and the benefits of the real estate there can accrue to Sherburn Commons and its residents. We're not sure that's going to work out yet, but we have some. Uh, David Worth has been very helpful in this process in doing the negotiations. We have always felt there's a possibility to move our island home from where it is. It needs substantial repairs and improvements. And Sherburn Commons is a potential location, and it's as a new facility. It's not to use the facility that exists there today. A new facility would meet the code. Well, I think the question was what my one vote could do, and I can tell you that my one vote would not do anything that would... Uh, have any impact on the residents of Sherman Commons. We, I think we're in the driver's seat here. We own the land. The town of Nantucket owns the land. So anyone that comes in there and wants to take that, that piece over has to make a deal with the town. And the deal that uh, was there with Northbridge was not a good deal for the town or for the residents, despite what the residents were being told. Uh, the Northbridge wanted to take the, uh, the uh, cottages and sell them off and put that money in their pocket. And that's just not right. It's, it's town land, and if anybody should be getting the profit, it should be the residents or the town. Um, nobody's going to get thrown out on the street as long as the town owns the land. They have to negotiate with us, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to make sure that the best deal possible is for the residents. As far as the Allen home goes, it needs a lot of major upkeep. Um, it needs to either be completely renovated or a new one be built. Um, we're one of the last two towns in the Commonwealth 
that have uh, town-owned um, facilities. So, I, and I think we should stay with that. Whether the facility stays there or moves somewhere else, we'll have to see. But that's where I'm at with that. Adam. Uh, well, Sherburn Commons is a mess, clearly, and it's going to be a while till we can get uh, something straightened out there. But I think it's a good example of a lack of long-term vision and planning by the town, finding us in these messes that are now seemingly impossible to get out of. Uh, I think we have opportunities to do those kind of things better now uh, in terms of the island home. Uh, there is a need for uh, increased services and uh, renovations. From the people I've talked to at the Island Home, though, there's a concern. Uh, they love it there, and they love having that waterfront view. Um, and I think the new facility that would cost tons of money uh, would be so large that it wouldn't really be necessary for Nantucket. Uh, I think we could better renovate that building. And ACDC, uh, which is being completely cut, um, is an issue, too, that I think we should talk about, if you want to talk about it. Cliff? Did I just, I started, didn't I? You started. Yes, I did. I'll do it again, though. I get a better <laughs> answer this time. <laughs> you did start. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep track here. Okay. We're now going to start with a question that we'll have Rick begin with. Um, and this, que this uh, person says, can you comment on how the public-private arrangement has worked and works now with waste options? <laughs> waste options. D double the time. <laughs> uh, I'll try not to go back in history. I've, I've been involved with this contract since the beginning as a member of the Finance Committee. Um, I will say that uh, there have been some changes at Waste Options. I think the organization is, as a partner for the town, is much more responsive today. Thank you for the button. I'll start over. Um, I have a history with Waste Options. <laughs> as a member of the Finance Committee. And, and, and I, as I said, the um, Waste Options itself has had managerial changes. I think the organization is far more responsive to the needs of the community than it was before. Um, I was not in favor of what we call flow control, so I supported the opportunity for Miles Reese to set up a competing C and D facility. I think the recent amendment to the contract giving waste options the ability to approach that part of their responsibility to the town with market-based pricing will benefit all of us in the end. So I think the uh, relationship has improved dramatically recently. So, Bob? Well, I was the descending vote on this amendment to the contract. I, I think it's a bad deal for the town, personally. I voted against it. Um, I, I have no problem with Miles going into the C&D business. I think we're paying Waste Options too much money for what they call C&D. Um, and I think behind the scenes, Waste Options is saying that, well, this money is earmarked for C&D, but it actually goes to other, other parts of the facility. If that's the case, open your books, show us where the money's going. Uh, they don't seem to want to do that. I think we have, we're, you know, I got saddled with a bad contract when I came in here as a selectman and um, I wasn't going to make it worse, so that's why I was a descending vote on the uh, on the amendment in my mind. Yeah. <clears throat> Adam, uh, I'm going to have to agree with Bob on that one. Uh, I, the contract's up in about seven years, I think, and Ten. seven, yeah. Uh, and even though it's that's seven years away, I think this is something we really need to start talking about now to create a plan for the future. Uh, I think the town could do it better, and I think there's opportunities for us to have better services out there and a better dump out there. Um, and like Bob said, it, I don't think it's a good deal. And I don't like what waste management's doing out there. And I think it's time that we take back control over those things. Cliff? I was asked as part of the Finance Committee to uh, give a recommendation whether or not to take the contract or not to uh, sign the contract. So I had about three or four days uh, to look it over and look at the numbers and look at the formula, uh, talk to George Aronson. Um, from what he told me and assured me that um, it's, it's, it's probably a calamity of errors from uh, past administrations we won't talk about. But um, what it's come down to is they're responsible supposedly for the online and line cells and uh, for disposing of uh, the compost. And so, as Bobby said, those expenses, which we referred to as, say, uh, the $35,000 we give for the building, really isn't 
uh, $35,000 for the building because the building hasn't even been there for a year. Um, and there's a handling fee, and that's also really doesn't go for handling. So I think uh, I'm, I'm glad the subject finally came up about the landfill because for the four years I've been around, we really don't talk about the landfill. Um, so I've got a great education just in the last month or so, and I think the main thing we need out there is more transparency, and I think they're supposed to open their books under the new contract. Okay, this next question will begin with you, Bob, and the question is, at town meeting April 5th, Article 90 will ask voters to give new town employees <clears throat> a choice of retirement plans, either the existing plan or a 401k. Where do you stand on this article? Um, I'm all for it, but I don't know if the unions are going to allow it. Um, you know, one of the most, ex one of the biggest things that is going to affect the town in the next six years is the increase in retirement and medical benefits. Um, Rick, help me here. I think it's around 18% a year is what we're figuring right now. Yeah, the increases are going to be large and the unfunded liability right. probably is so just So if huge. you look at our annual budget and you just extrapolate that number out 18% over the next 10 years and then you look at 2.5%, which is the max that we can raise taxes, uh, the numbers just don't jive. Um, and it's a, it's a concern that everyone has in the town, but it's not an easy fix. And, you know, the... the new employees, taking new employees and putting them on a, a different retirement system versus the, um, the Barnesville retirement might be a way to do it, but I don't know contractually if we're going to be able to do it. Adam? Yes. Uh, I know there's a lot of concerns from the town employees. I did their forum the other night uh, and they were not in favor of it, uh, but I think we do need to balance those concerns with the needs of the community and the town as a whole. Uh, it's going to put us in a sticky financial situation if we don't switch to something. Uh, and my understanding is that it uh, really wouldn't affect the current town employees. It would be optional, and the only people it would affect would be the new incoming town employees. So I 100% support Article 90. Cliff? Well, I think it's a can of worms because, again, we talked about the mechanics, whether it's the leadership of mechanics and under Chapter 32, the state controls the pensions, not the town of Nantucket. So then you have to battle with the state. Um, we had the Barnesville Retirement uh, representative come down and look at the, the cost. And uh, I'm in the federal government. I'm under a different program. I'm more of a that uh, diverse program with the 401k and the FERS program. And I... I fund part of my pension. Um, I voted on the Finance Committee to take no action again this year because I was going to wait for the Wage and Compensation Committee to come in, and then hopefully we were going to allocate some money to have an unbiased opinion uh, on the pensions as far as what it really costs or what it would look like because now you have to match the Social Security, and like the federal government, they match the 401K. So in the end, is it really a, uh, a savings to the town? Because I think why the federal government went that way in 1986 was more so to probably uh, save Social Security, not so much to try to save money. So we know, we know the devil we have. We don't know the devil we're going to get. So anyway, I say we wait another year. Rick? Yeah, the, the way the article has uh, developed, it's developed into a request to town meeting for a home rule petition because the state does control the pension and retirement structure for our employees. Um, but it's meant to be purely an option for new employees. Current employees stay right where they are. Nobody loses anything. New employees can join the pension plan that exists today if they choose to do so. No changes there. So no employees are going to be obligated to lose anything. To me, the nice thing about the article and why I support it is that it offers a choice. And I think it's the kind of choice that uh, Nantucket can bring to the state and it starts a dialogue at the state level which otherwise may not occur. And I think that's going to be helpful for everybody. In the long term, our problem is more in the health insurance issue than it is in the pension plan. Right now, our employees pay a substantial portion of their compensation into the pension plan. So they're very invested, one, whether it's a 401k or the pension. Health insurance is a very different matter, and the outlook for those costs are not good from the community point of view. Okay. Um, 
we're right on schedule and actually there's about a three minute buffer built into the schedule so I'm going to go with one more question because I think it's an important one and this one will start with you Adam. Many of you have spoken of the importance of water quality. What will you do to see that the new fertilizer regulations will be enforced? Uh, yeah, it's important and we're, we are, we're polluting our waterways uh, and it's so important to our, our shellfish uh, industry and just public health. Uh, the only way I see to enforce it is to create some sort of enforcement officer who can go out there and uh, check these things to hold people accountable, to make sure that they're doing these things right and to make sure that people are certified. Because um, we've, we require certification, but we have nothing to actually enforce that or to make sure that they're not putting too much chemicals on. Because if we don't do it that way, um, then we could solve this problem. If we, if we went out there and enforced it and gave some fines and got people in trouble, that would be the way. Enforcement. Cliff? I know we've been dealing with this for uh, a couple of years. I think it was two years ago, if you drove by uh, this building, we had a, a seminar or a class about just that, the fertilizer, and it was, I think there was a lot of participation. So I think the community uh, has uh, got involved, and um, as far as trying to make people do it, uh, that's a whole other story, but I think uh, they've rallied around it, and I think they are in favor of it, and I think we've done a lot for the water quality, whether it's uh, the soaring or the building up the jetties or the, or the fertilizer. So I think I think we're uh, I think we're progressing in the right direction. Rick, well, I think we've got two things going on. One is the question of uh, septic sewer, and we've got a comprehensive wastewater management plan update, and we're going to hear shortly how that plays out and where they recommend sewering. Get, getting back to the fertilizer issue, I, my own sense is, you know, ninety percent of our property owners want to do the right thing. I think we as a town need to help facilitate that, talk to the retailers, make sure the right product is available, information is available to homeowners. But at the same time, and I understand the town is working on a method to redeploy some of our staff during the summer period for periodic checks. And uh, there will be an enforcement mechanism in that regard. But really, the, the answer is we all enforce it ourselves. So. Bob? I believe it's all about education. I mean, I think an enforcement officer would be good for spot checks, but uh, I remember uh, I was on SHAB when we wrote the uh, Harbor Management Plan and we made Nantucket Harbor one of the first no discharge zones in, in the Northeast. And we actually put dye tablets in holding tanks to make sure nobody was pumping their septic into the harbor. And we went from where it was the norm for everyone to just pump their, their tanks, their holding tanks, wherever they want, to now we pump more sewerage out of boats and through the pump outs in the marina and the town pier than any harbor in the northeast. I think in the, on the whole east coast, actually. Um, most people want to do the right things. I think 99% of people want to do the right things. And when you educate them that this is bad for the environment, they will do the right thing. Look at recycling. We recycle here. It's, it's automatic. Our kids automatically recycle. Even in places when they go to college and they don't recycle, they still recycle. Um, I think it's just going to be a matter of educating people, the landscapers especially. They don't care what if it costs $3 more a bag. They're just going to pass it along. So I think people will do the right thing when taught to do the right thing. Okay, we're at a point now f where we're going to enter, we're going to have the closing statements and I want each candidate to limit their statement to one minute and uh, the dial has rotated to you, Cliff, as the first closing statement. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd just like to thank the Civic League and everybody who's uh, involved, Gino. Um, like I said, I was born and raised here in Nantucket. Uh, I have an eight-year-old son. I don't plan on leaving unless they probably kick me out. Um, I've spent the last, like I said, four or five years trying to educate myself on the budget and uh, all the uh, capital projects, uh, the future in Nantucket. Um, hopefully uh, I've taken those experiences and that knowledge along with uh, everything I've learned over the period of the last 50 years of my life and I can uh, implement it in the best interest of the uh, town of Nantucket. And uh, I look for your vote. Thank you very much. Rick. Yes, um, sort of this goes back to the beginning. Um, I, I've enjoyed serving. I like what I do as a selectman. I think I do a good job, quite frankly. I work hard at it. 
and I would very much like to continue. Um, I think I've brought a sense of uh, fiscal responsibility and proper financial management. We're doing a much better job in those areas. And I think my continuing on the board helps keep the community on sort of the straight and narrow in that regard. Uh, I am committed to making sure that our environment is uh, clean as it can be and that uh, we have the proper resources to do that. And I do seek your vote. Um, I wouldn't be here running again if I didn't feel I could contribute. Uh, and I look forward to everybody voting on the 15th. Thank you. I just like to continue along the path that I've started in the last three years, finish out some projects, um, water quality, uh, the town infrastructure, as far as plan space needs are two that st stick out to me right now. Um, you know, I grew up in Nantucket, and this is not the small town that we grew up in when I was a kid. There were 2,500 people on this island year-round, and if somebody drove by you and you didn't recognize you, you turned around and followed them to see where they were going because you <laughs> wouldn't know where it was. And you could drive on the beach at Jetties and drive all the way around the tip of Code 2, and nobody said a word to you. And now you've got literally two miles of beach, if you're lucky, that you can drive on, and we have 10 to 12,000 people here year-round. So this isn't never going to be the little island that we used to know. I mean, those days are gone, unfortunately. Um, and that's the real world, and that's what we have to deal with now, and that's what we have to govern with now. And uh, uh, I, I would love nothing more to see it go back to that, but it's not going to happen, so we have to work with what we have and make it as, as much a home as we can. And that's what I'm going to try to do if I get reelected. Adam? Uh, I think if we're talking about building resiliency and sustainability for a, for a year-round local community, that we need to take back uh, control of some of our basic resources. Housing is an obvious one, renewable energy, uh, and food, community-supported agriculture. Uh, I think by taking back control of these basic resources, uh, taking back control of our local economy, uh, by creating more small businesses, uh, that we can really build resilience for this community and that we can last for another couple of generations uh, and that these systems that are in place don't have to be the systems. We can create new systems, better systems, and all it takes is for 51% of the community to stand up and say, this isn't the way we want it done. We want it done this way. And so my goal as a selectman will be to create that cohesive community voice that can push us forward. Uh, thank you. Okay, we'll have a 30-second intermission. Oh, no, I was first, I guess. Oh, were you first? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought you were first. All right. I got it right this time. Okay. All right.